Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church, Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us as we go back to Genesis in our series, As Adam. We hope you enjoy today's lesson. Good morning. We are in the book of Genesis for the next couple months, so if you want to read through that book, that would be a great idea. Last week I looked at Genesis 2. Today we're looking at Genesis 3, the fall of man, not one of our happier chapters in the Bible, but there is great benefit in studying this chapter, Genesis 3. We have a lot of learning that can take place for our lives in Genesis 3. In fact, what are some of those? What are some benefits of studying Genesis 3 and how we fell into sin? How can this benefit our lives? We don't want to study it and just have it be a downer, right? What can we learn from this? The mistake of pride. What else? How the enemy works. Yes. Is he still working the same way he worked on Adam and Eve and us? Absolutely. So it gives some insight into the enemy's tactics. What else? Yeah, have you ever looked at Genesis 3 and like, oh man, these people, why did they do this? How could they do this? But then you realize like you're their descendant and you do the exact same thing. And perhaps if you were put in that situation, there's a good chance that you might have done the same. And we know the negative consequences of sin, right? They really didn't experience that. I mean, they didn't know what we know about the negative consequences of sin. Now, they didn't have a sinful nature. We've got that going against us, too, that they did not have. Uh, they, we had this inner drive to sin. We had this inner desire to sin. They didn't have that yet, but they're going to they're gonna get that. Anything else on why, what we can benefit from studying the fall of man? And God still does that. There's a lot of things here we'll see as we look at this passage that are right applicable for our life today. They run right along with us. So let's look at it here. Genesis 3, chapter 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, wait, time out, okay? So you've got a serpent who talks. When he talks to the woman, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Like you see Balaam's donkey talking to Balaam, and it was a big deal, right? But... This passage just tells us what happened. It doesn't comment on it. She's not shocked that this created being can, created animal can speak to her. She just engages him in a conversation, just like it's no big deal. Were the other animals talking? I don't know. We don't know. It's, it's just strange to us, but nevertheless, that's what happened. Now, it also says he was more crafty than any other beast in the field. Well, Jesus told us to be wise as serpents. Now, uh, when Spurgeon talks about this passage, he says, look, um, a disembodied spirit looks for a body to manifest itself in. Okay, so if a spirit is out there and the devil's a spirit or whatever, or a demon's a spirit, it cannot, it can do things, but it can't really manifest itself unless it dwells in something, that it can, like a body that it can manifest itself from. That made sense to me. So the serpent was allowed to, uh, the devil was allowed to go into this created being, okay? The devil wasn't created here in Genesis 3. He'd been around. He'd been an angel. He'd, he'd been a fallen angel for a while. And now he's, he goes into the body of the serpent. And he starts talking to the woman. Why do you think he talked to the woman first? Let me go ahead, let me, let me go ahead and say this because it might be a little more difficult for our culture to, to say. But um, Paul says the woman is the weaker vessel. Does Paul say the woman is the inferior vessel? No, but to be weaker does not mean to be inferior. So let's say a little baby. Is a little baby inferior to me because the baby is a baby? No, absolutely not. The Apostle Paul calls woman the weaker vessel. And so most commentators believe that the serpent attacked the person and isolated the person that he thought could have he could have the best chances with. If you study Genesis 2, Eve was not given this command. Adam was given the command to not eat the fruit of the tree. She, now, now maybe the Lord may have told her separately, but more than likely, he told her about it. Okay? So you look at Genesis 2. He was commanded, Adam was commanded before Eve was created not to eat of this fruit. So the serpent goes and attacks the, the woman. And women in our society need to understand that, you know, the, the world tells you that submission is inferiority. Okay? So if I submit to my boss, my boss must be superior to me no no my boss is not more important to me more valuable to me than me okay we're all we're all equal in the lord's sight but we do have different roles because i submit to our pastor does that mean the pastor is more important than me 
I mean, we'll let God decide that, but we're each created with something to do, with a role to play. And just because there is order in creation, order in the home, it does not imply inferiority. And you need to understand that if you're going to understand the scripture. Because the society says it is. Society says, oh, if you can't do this, then you must be inferior. It's not true. Well, the enemy, Satan, goes straight to the woman. And he starts to engage in a conversation with her. First problem here. Don't get into a conversation with the enemy, right? You tell him, get behind me, Satan. You quote scripture at him, but you don't get into a conversation with him. We're easily influenced. It's very important who you surround yourself with and who you're listening to in your life. Who, who, who's giving you input, okay? Who, who you're engaging in conversation with. You know, if I'm coming in Monday morning at work, I'm, man, this could be a great week. Praise the Lord. I'm awesome. Thank you for this job, Lord. I'm going to serve you today. And the first person I see says, can you believe they're making us do this? Yeah. And you say, yeah, that is wrong. You know, I can't believe that. So you, who you bring into your life and who influences you are very important. Well, the enemy comes to the woman and he says, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree of the garden? What is he doing here? That's not, he knows what the command is. The enemy knows what the command is. And he's saying, you can't eat of any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the fruit of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now she added, neither shall you touch it. We don't know if she added that or Adam added that to her. Just don't even touch it. But nevertheless, that's what she tells the serpent. But look what the serpent says to her. See, he says to the woman, you will not surely die. Line number one. Do we die? Yes, we die. When you sin, and you know you shouldn't sin, and you do it anyway, is there any life in that spiritual life you feel afterwards? Does it feel like spiritual death when you sin after you know you shouldn't have done something and you do it? So, yes, lie number one, you shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right. So here the serpent is telling her, don't worry about what God said. Don't listen to his provision. He has ulterior motives. Is he calling into question the goodness of God? When God tells us not to do something, if he tells us don't have sex before marriage, is he protecting us? Yes, absolutely is. If he says don't get drunk or don't do drugs or whatever, is he protecting you? If he says go to church on Sunday, is he protecting you by that command? If he says read your word, is he protecting you with that command? Yes. Everything God commands us to do in the Bible is for our protection, right? Because he loves us, because he's good. Does the enemy love us? Does the enemy seeking our good as the serpent seeking their good? Why is he getting here in the first place and messing everything up? Because he hates God and he hates God's children. And the more death and misery he can spread to people, the happier he is, I guess, in a sick way, right? So first thing he does is call into question the goodness of God and says, oh, no, uh, you think there's a benefit from not eating this. I'm going to tell you there's a benefit from eating this fruit. It's funny that we as human beings, you know, God told them you can enjoy this whole creation except this one tree. And what do they do? <laughs> From the one tree. All right. So uh, are we a little bit like that? Are we a little bit like, well, you know, God's giving me salvation. He's giving me eternal life. He's giving me his word. He's giving me a job. He's giving me a car. He's giving me a... But you know what? I like to have that thing. So yeah. there are lots of wonderful things God has blessed us with in the world. But why do we want that one thing we're not supposed to have, right? Well, that's, that's part of our nature now, but this is the temptation here. Now, before we get into this temptation a little more, let's, let's remember the sin is actually eating of the fruit, okay? Some people say they sin before that. I, I, don't, I don't think that. I think the sin is actually when you disobey the command. You can be tempted to do something and not sin, right? There's a difference. You can be tempted to do something and then say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Christian, and you can walk away. Praise God. So... You can be tempted and not sin, right? <laughs> so, uh, serpent says to her, you will not die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, meaning you'll see things in a different way, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, she already knew good. Why would you want to know evil? She's getting ready to know evil. Now, she's thinking, I'm intellectually going to know the difference between good and evil, and that's curious to me. I've never experienced that before. Our curiosity is up. But she's going to actually experience evil. 
So he's going to experience the consequences of evil, right? Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant for the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. And for us in our own lives, when we bring sin into our lives, we as well still try to present a covering, do we not? Or am I the only one in this? That you try to find ways to cover your sin. I'm going to pull away from God for a little bit, and I'm going to isolate because I can't approach Him right now. We're hiding behind that tree once again from God, even though He already knows our sin. When He turned around after Adam and Eve sinned, and He is walking through the garden and He calls out to them. He didn't call out to them because He didn't know where they were. He was calling out to them to bring them back to Himself, which is what God does for us as well when we sin. It's not that He's wanting to call us out in our sin. He's wanting to call us back home to Him because our sin has no place when He's present. And that's what he was doing to Adam and Eve. He was trying to give them the chance to come back to him in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said to his wife, and he hid themselves in the uh, presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So question for you. What are ways in which we try to hide ourselves from God when we sin? I gave you one, isolation. Set down the word for a little bit. Busy word. Yeah. It's funny, actually, you can be so far away from God and be serving in this church. I don't know about y'all, I've seen it. I've done it before. I was so far away from God having to force myself to preach a word, and I'm like, I am not qualified for this. This is going to be horrible. Lord, don't strike me down. Because we're held to a higher standard when you share His word. So God, He knew Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree. He knew it before it was going to happen anyway. And He gave them the chance to come back to Him, and He called out to Him. So right now, I think for our own lives, are you at a place in your own walk where you are in a place of sin or have a pattern of sin in your own life and you're hiding from God? I had a Cuban underground pastor. He used to oversee 400 pastors in Cuba. And I had him staying at my house for about six months while he was trying to get immigration status. So he was trying to get to the U.S. to bring him and his kids and his wife over. And he was really uh, having a hard time. And one day we're in my uh, living room and we're talking. And I remember when he said something, and it stuck with me still to this day. And he goes, can I ask you a question? He goes, what does a lion eat? And you're like, meat. A lion eats meat. He goes, okay. He goes, and what are you called to walk in? We're called to walk in the Spirit, are we not? We're to walk by faith, not by sight. We're to walk in the Spirit. And what he said to me in that moment was, is it's only when we are found walking in the flesh that the enemy has something to bite onto. Only when we're walking in the flesh does he have something to bite onto, because you can't bite his spirit. And that's what the enemy did with Eve here, is he enticed her. She bit, literally, bit of that fruit that he presented. So, verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, once again, you can look at it as God didn't know that they ate of the tree, right? Now, why is he asking? If he, if he knows everything, why is he asking? It's because he's trying to get Adam to a place of confession. He's trying to get him to a place of confession. And Adam had to get to that place of confession, which he does. And he gets into it in verse 12. And then he said, to the, uh, then the man said, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. I would tell you this is the first example of passivity in Scripture. He was very passive here. He instead did not take the blame for what he did. Now, why would it be important that Adam actually take the blame for this? He was the first. He also, in verse 15, was said to keep and to tend the garden. Adam, you're going to possess what I give you, and you're going to steward what I give you. Mm -hmm. He watched her eat it. He said, it even says, he was with her when she ate of the tree. He was trying to blame the woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me the tree and I ate. So then I have a question for you then. Are we blaming God for our own Absolutely. sin and failures right now? Shouldn't be that we're tempted of God. 
That's a great one to say. Because God does not tempt. Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because of you you have done this. You are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. That sounds like a horrible life for that sin, if I do say so. But we're deserving of even worse. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, let's stop there for a second. Where does seed come from? Between, the, between a male and a female, where does seed come from? The male. The male. And, God, and God specifically said, it is between your seed, talking to Eve, between your seed, Eve, and between his seed. So the seed is going to come from Eve. How can that happen? I'm glad you asked. Ha! The Immaculate Conception. Because in Christ there was no seed. It was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So there was no sin nature there. He was born blameless and spotless as he also died. He was blameless and spotless for us. So he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. How did Satan bruise Jesus' heel? Let's think about this. What happened? On Calvary. Mm. So, Satan bruised Jesus' heel while on Calvary, and he was crucified for us. And Satan thought that it was a death blow, but it was only a temporary victory. Because three days later, we obviously know, he resurrected and ascended back to the Father after that. But... Satan himself, where it says, and you are in about, he shall bruise your head. Jesus himself on Calvary, when he died for our sins, and he resurrected and he ascended back to the Father, he gave a death blow to Satan and his works in this world. Now, I've heard it once said, though, there was this missionary pastor that was in the Amazonian forest, rainforest, and one day in the small little village that he had, there was around seven huts in this little bitty village that he was living in. And one day, he goes into his hut, and he looks in there, and there's this huge anaconda. About a 14-foot anaconda had crawled into his hut. And he freaks out and runs out of the hut, and he runs to the village elder. And he said, there is a snake in my hut. Can someone come and get this? So they grab a machete, and they go running into the hut. This one guy did. And he goes in, and he cuts off that serpent's head. And as soon as he cut off that serpent's head, he goes running back out of the hut. And that, that missionary goes, why are you running out of the hut? You just killed it. For two and a half hours, that snake's body thrashed and destroyed everything in that hut. The muscle spasms that continued to come allowed that snake to destroy everything in this man's hut. And I say that to say this is the enemy himself has already received the death blow. He has already received the death blow. Jesus crushed his head on Calvary when he died for us. But what you're seeing in the world today with the sin that we're seeing and the destruction and the, and the mayhem that we're seeing, all we're witnessing right now is a thrashing of a dead snake that's waiting to be cleaned out. We're seeing it. The enemy has already been defeated, but yet we allow the situations of this world to convince us that we need to live in defeat. We have been giving a victory. The enemy has already been defeated. Stand in that place and walk in that truth, because that is what's going to allow you to continue in this journey with the joy that God's called us to walk in, is knowing and resting in the truth that the victory has already been given. And he promised it. And that was verse 15. God made a promise in that moment to us. He was speaking to Eve, and it was a promise that has rung out throughout generations, letting us know that the promise of the Messiah at the beginning of time was always there. Jesus was not a second chance or a replacement option for creation. He was the one that authored it, He was the one that perfected it, and He is the one that speaks it. It was not a second chance. 
it was the only chance that we had to overcome. And God knew that. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I did not prepare too much on that specific verse, but let's talk about it. I will greatly, uh, greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And, and if you look at what God's design was, it's exactly that. A woman is to submit to her husband. A husband is to submit to God. That's right. Because the man is the covering for the woman and God is the covering for the man. That's how we're to live. So he says, in your pain, you shall bring forth children. I think something that's interesting is there's a verse that told me, uh, I believe it's in Proverbs, but the verse that comes to my mind is, as a woman in travail, that the moment that child enters the world, she remembers the pain no more. And that, that is something that I can say, not just with childbirth, but I think in our own walk, in our own life, is the moments that we stumble and we fall into these depressive states, we fall into these moments of shame and condemnation that we allow the enemy to let us live under, it's painful. But it's when we allow God to do something through those moments, through those times, and through those situations, and He brings forth this beautiful blessing, this beautiful promise at the end of it, that we no longer remember the pain that's to come. Look at Revelation where He even says that when I appear, when I come back, that those momentary sufferings will no longer even compare to the glory that's to be revealed. Verse 17, Then to Adam He said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. I want to stop there for a second. There's something there that just stuck out to me. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Why would it be for your sake that he curses the ground? And think, and what happened, you're, you're going in the vein of thought where I was going with this. We're going we're to have struggles. We're going to have some troubles. And what happens when we encounter troubles and struggles in our life? What does it cause us to do? Cry out to God. It's for our sake that he cursed the ground. Because it's the thing that continues to drive us back to God every time it presents itself. It was a blessing. So it was for our, our blessing that he cursed the ground. Because it drives us back to God every time. Verse 18, Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. How does that happen for us today? I always want to go there for a second. We sow into people, we sow into our jobs, we sow into our families. And how often when we do all this sowing do we actually see thorns and thistles instead of fruit? Do we allow the thorns and the thistles to stop us from doing that? I pray not all the time. And I hope with time, it's less and less of the time. I really do. Because it's the thorns and the thistles in our life that, yes, they're painful moments as well. And it's difficult, especially working as a gardener. I love to garden. Jerry's seen my garden. Well, he used to see my garden. Now it's at my new place. Hey, your garden tastes pretty good. I love my garden. Yeah, you've eaten, you've eaten out of my garden. And the thing with a garden, when you're growing and it's painful because you get weeds, you get all of these bugs and pests and insects, and it eats up your plants. It destroys everything. It's a pain in the butt. I'm going to tell you right now how many times I've talked to God about this. It's a pain in the butt. But one thing, though, is it says in Scripture about how nature testifies of God, doesn't it? Absolutely, and in the garden daily, I have to go and look for bugs. In the garden daily, I have to go and pull weeds. In the garden daily, I have to make sure that I'm harvesting the fruit when it's ready. And that is what we're to do in our own lives. Take that same care, that same attention, and daily clean and manage and beautify the garden that God has placed you in currently. Look for the thorns that you have. Allow them to be removed. Look for the thistles. Pull them up by the root. Look for the pests and the insects that are trying to devour the blessings that God's already given you and pull them out of your life. And what does he say? A wise man will stumble and fall seven times, but pick himself up and continue on in righteousness. 
A foolish man will stumble and fall and carry on in mischief. Are we being wise and picking ourselves up and continuing on in righteousness? Or are we allowing ourselves to dwell in the pit of sin that we find ourselves in? Verse 19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. To me, I think God is also trying to keep a level of humility with Adam here. He has to remind him. Remember where you came from, Adam. It was from the dust that you came. Don't get a big head on yourself thinking that you're better now. Stay humble. Are we reminding ourselves daily to stay humble as well? Because he says that we're to live humbly. Or even more importantly, I think a word that I love to, to remember and hold on to as well is meek. We're to be meek. Meekness. We're to walk and live in meekness. And do you understand what meekness is? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk. Meekness. The way it's actually broken down is, have anyone ever been around a horse? Have y'all ever ridden a horse, been on a horse, horseback riding, trail riding? Okay. Horse. So a horse, very muscular, very big animal. And what they'll do is they put this little bit in its mouth, and there's a little, whore, a little uh, rope on both sides connected to the actual stirrup, and you're able to make the horse move the direction that you want. Make him go faster, make him stop, make him back up. It controls the horse. That little bit controls that horse. And what God says about how we are to be meek, recognize your strength, recognize how powerful you are through Christ and the Holy Spirit living within you, and keep it under control. That little bit is meek. That little bit controls all that strength. And that's how we're to live. We're to sit there and control ourselves in the same manner. That's why he says, take every thought captive. There's a reason. Because it's their strength is under control. It's when it's not under control that we have an issue. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. We're going to stop there for a moment. They had sinned correct? She ate of the tree, he observed, and then even told God, it was your fault that this even happened. How often do we blame God for the issues in our own lives instead of taking responsibility? So Eve, she sinned. Adam blamed God for this sin, which I'm sure we've all done it a time or two or 20 or 50 or however many times in our life that we've been doing it. And he says about how the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. That was the first covering that was the first covering. Adam acknowledged his sin. He admits that, yes, I ate of this, but it's because of you that I did it. But at least he got out that what he did. He confessed to what his sin was. And because he was able to confess to what the sin was, God was able to offer a covering for him, which is the first sacrifice. Even though it's not listed as a sacrifice, God killed the first animal and made a covering for man, which is also a kind of a foreshadowing of the covering that we as sinners in this world need. We need a covering to cover our nakedness. We have one through Christ. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. God removed them from the blessing that he gave them of the garden. And because we squandered the blessing of the garden, God now, due to the curse that is on the ground that God had created, man has to earn his food by the sweat of his brow. And that, unfortunately, has transcended time because to this day, we have to wrestle and fight for what we have in this world. Or is that just me? Because I feel like I'm fighting a lot nowadays. Or maybe it's just me. Whew. Hello. And he owns the th cattle on a thousand hills. I ain't worried about it. He always provides. I just don't know how. So therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So it is now by the sweat of our brow that we must eat, which is why I think it was even Paul that said it about uh, those that don't work, don't eat. It's because the effort that you put in is what you 
should actually glean from. God gave you gifts. God gave you abilities. God gave you a calling. God, going back to Genesis 2, placed you in a position of rest before him. And God is the one that allows you to stand before him naked and unashamed because his blood covers you. So everything we do, we should do for him. It's a service and an act of worship to God in all that we do. So he drove the man out and he placed the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which is turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God had to take them from the future that he wanted for them and allow them to experience the effects of their own sin, which we have allowed to experience as well. But it's in those moments, just like he did with Adam, and he said it about how he cursed the ground for our sake. The struggles and troubles in our life are for our sake because it continues to keep us humble before a holy and righteous God. And it continues to push us back to him and his heart because it's the love of God that drives men to repentance. And when you harden your heart, or you look at Adam and you instead blame God for what's happening in your life and for the situations of your life, then he also does another thing for us. He says that I chasten those that I love to drive them to repentance. So I don't know about you, I would rather allow the love of God to compel me to repent and not have to deal with the ramifications of being chastened to be driven back to repentance. And we can trust that the sacrifice that God offered through Jesus was enough to restore us. And that we can stand naked and unashamed once again before a holy and righteous God. And we can know that no matter what we're going through in life, He also says that you are to approach His throne with confidence and thanksgiving and let your request be made known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your heart. So let's do that. Let's allow the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our heart this week. Let's walk in the confidence that the work has been completed and that everything that we are doing in life is for our sake and for His glory because He said it was. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time, hope you all have a great week.